20 is in chapter 14. Okay, so these two chapters that finish out the Rowell and Wormley text, 14 and 15, are more involved than some of the previous chapters. And so we're going to slow down and we're going to spend two weeks on each of these. I'm, uh, uh, that's part of why I've been sort of moving us along at a pretty good pace is that I wanted to get to these chapters and slow down a little bit because I think it's, they're really important and they're a little hard to get sometimes. Yeah. So then the next book, the controls book, yeah. when are we going to be getting? We're going to be getting to that. So spring break. It'll probably be later. So yeah, so it's, it'll be right. So we're going to spend the next four class weeks. There's a fifth week in there because it's spring break. But uh, we're going to spend the next four class weeks on chapters 14 and 15 of Rowell and Wormley. Then we're going to get to the controls text in the, the, for, the last, it's for the last five weeks before finals week. We're going to be out of that book. And so we're going to make some good progress there. Yeah. Are we also going to be starting a project at this number? So probably is going to wait till after spring break because we're going to do a midterm right before spring break. And then we're going to do uh, start up the project at that point. The project is going to be, I think it's going to be pretty straightforward, but I want you guys to actually get a little bit of a chance to design something. And we're just going to make, it's going to be a one large class project, and we're going to just develop teams and go forward. So you guys all know how to do some 3D modeling. You guys know how to do a lot of analysis. So. I want you guys to actually get a chance to like design, build something. Hopefully we can actually build it and test it and see if it fits our model, which I think it should. I think we should be able to model it pretty well. It's going to be, um, since we're temperature controlling, it's going to probably be an electrothermal system. Okay? Uh, so it should be fun. Yeah, I mean, like it's really not that hard to heat something. Um, that's not that hard, but uh, we might want to cool too. I don't know. Maybe we should have that as part of it. So I think we should talk about that a little bit. Cooling is a little more difficult. Heating's pretty easy. If we have a heat pump, we can do both. Um, and depending on the temperatures that we need, there are also these nice things called thermoelectric coolers. Uh, which are really nice, really cheap, but they, you know, they, they can't go huge temperature ranges either, so we may be able to get away with something like that. Not, Not very efficient, but they're easy to use and very inexpensive, so we might, we might end up with that. I don't know, we'll see. Well, I, I, want, I don't want to start limiting our design space yet, but uh, so more to come on that. Well, let's talk about the fundamentals of frequency response. So, in chapter 14, we're going to take this perspective. We're going to say, what if we have a sinusoidal input? Okay. What happens to that sinusoidal input as it goes through the system and comes out the other side? Now, we're dealing with linear systems here. And you may recall, oh, am I not? I'm not plugged in, am I? Shh. It's all frazzled this morning. Uh, you may recall that when we put a sinusoidal input into a system, we got a what out? Sinusoidal output to the system. Um, remember that was after we waited for a while, right? That was only in steady state that that was true because the transient response wasn't necessarily sinusoidal. It was some mixture of sinusoids and exponentials that were decaying. Um, but in steady state, we got a sinusoid out. So I'm going to plug this in and probably stop the recording on accident. Now we're back. So we've got... Um, this idea that we put in a sinusoid and in steady state we get out a sinusoid. So we kind of know where this is headed, okay? Uh, we put in a sinusoid, we get out a sinusoid in steady state. 
And the only two things that change, what are the two things that change in that sinusoid? Do you guys remember? Amplitude. amplitude change it. That's one of the two. Phase. Mm -hmm. Amplitude and phase. So if the amplitude and phase change, and that's it. Um, knowing how they change is a pretty important aspect of thinking about a sinusoidal input going to a sinusoidal output. We think, how does the amplitude change? How does the phase change? And that's what we're going to focus on in chapter 14. And you might think to yourself, okay, but like, how often are inputs sinusoidal, really? Um, because, I mean, okay, sure, you can make a sinusoidal input. Um, and maybe in electronics, there are lots of sinusoidal inputs because you have AC signals. But in other, in other systems, is, is it sinusoidal? Uh, the first answer is that it is very, very common. So sinusoidal inputs are, are quite common. Um, they're often used to model things like a vibration input, that type of thing, sinusoidal. However, it's not just for sinusoidal inputs that we're doing this. So next chapter we're going to learn about this really powerful concept that's called Fourier analysis, okay? So Fourier series, has anybody seen Fourier series before? Ah, okay, we had a few, few folks who have. So in Fourier series can be written for any periodic input. For any periodic input, the idea is that you could write it as a sum of sinusoids. And so all the analysis that we do for sinusoidal inputs becoming sinusoidal outputs is true for those signals as well, just a sum of all of them. And so this en ends up becoming very powerful. We can use it for any periodic input, um, the same sort of analysis. But it even goes further than that. We can go um, to the Fourier transform, and we can, we can look at aperiodic inputs from this perspective as well. So it's really powerful. You can look at sort of any input in this way. And as you'll see, looking at it in this way uh, is to look at it in terms of what we call the frequency domain. Okay, And that is, we think about the frequency of this input sinusoid. Right? You put a sinusoid, certain frequency in, you get an output at that frequency. Um, if you think about a system, we, we are interested to know how it responds to a sinusoid at each of those frequencies. So at any frequency, how does it respond? What is the ratio of its input amplitude to its output amplitude? Okay, That's what we care about. And we will uh, be able to construct plots in this frequency domain and think about things in terms of the frequency domain that will be really powerful. So we'll, we'll see as we proceed how powerful it is. But it's, it's common to think about systems in terms of the frequency domain, even more so than in the time domain. So we th thought about things in the time domain. We thought about how the transient responds and how uh, even it reaches steady state, but this is the, the, the time response. We've been focusing on time. We're going to start thinking in terms of frequency Soon, and we, we'll see that those characteristics are actually uh, sometimes much more interesting than the time domain aspects. So, for instance, filters might respond to inputs at certain frequencies well and then not at others. So, remember in mechatronics, when we did that lab where we had a filter and we were seeing that at certain frequencies, the output amplitude was large. The input amplitude was staying the same every time, but the output was larger for certain frequencies than for others. And we said we talked about how that's like kind of like a resonance and all that. This is all thinking in terms of the frequency domain, okay? And that's what we're going to be doing in this chapter 14 and chapter 15 as well, okay? It's very powerful stuff, 
and it's pretty exciting stuff. I, I really enjoy it, and that's part of why I'm just going to slow down a little bit for this, this, this part. So it's kind of a long intro, uh, and you might think that to get started in this, we're going to need a whole lot of math. But in reality, it's not that much to get started. There is going to be more math as we proceed. The, the math gets a little heavy in chapter 15. Um, but for now, it's actually pretty straightforward. So let's, let's see what we can do. So let's restrict ourselves to systems with sinusoidal inputs. So let's say that u of t is a sinusoidal input. Uh, with amplitude a sine omega t plus psi. So it has some input amplitude and some phase, psi. And its frequency is omega. So we're going to look at a complex sinusoid for a little bit of analysis here. And then we're going to um, use it to describe the response to this real sinusoid. So using Euler's formula, we can write a general complex sinusoid in exponential form this way. So u of t is equal to u of s e to the st if we evaluate s at j omega. So this is what our complex sinusoid looked like, right? when we, or our complex uh, inputs looked like when we derived the transfer function. Remember that? A complex amplitude, u of s, times e to the st. If we evaluate that at s equals j omega, we get this, what's called a, uh, a complex sinusoid, which is, notice that we, we say u of j omega, which is a little bit of a weird notation, but it's very common to just replace s with j omega. Technically, it's a function of omega, but we engineers sometimes abuse notation and stick the j in there, too. And so that is a very common way of writing it. Physicists usually don't put the j in. Engineers usually do. We're engineers, so we do. Um, but occasionally, I'll lapse and just do the omega, so catch me. Uh, so u of j omega times this, com this real cosine and then this imaginary sine. So we're going to use this. I'm going to say, OK, well, what if this is u of t, this complex one? And it just, we use it because the math works out nicely. And then in the end, we're going to see that we can use superposition to get the real one out <laughs> easily. So it turns out that mathematically, oftentimes, this complex sinusoid is nicer to work with. So we can work with it, and then we can use superposition in the end to get the real part that we care about. So common little trick we use. So we know we can find a transfer function h of s for a system with this input because it is an exponential, right? It's, it's a subset of the type of system that we learned already. We learned to use u of s times e to the st as our input to derive the transfer function. And so this is going to have a transfer function just like the other systems that we've looked at. Um, we are usually concerned about the steady state response of systems to sinusoidal inputs. These occur after the transient response has decayed, like I said. So that is when the response is just the particular solution. So the steady state solution is, is the full solution as you take time further and further out. And that's what we were focused on right now in this analysis, is all steady state analysis. So we can write this in terms of a transfer function. So we can say that uh, let's see yp of t is equal to h of s e to the s t, right? Um, uh, wait. 
h of s times u of s, right? e to the st. That's just, just back from our transfer function discussion. Okay. Uh, we're going to say, OK, for sinusoidal inputs, s, so complex sinusoidal input, s is equal to j omega. So let's just plug that in. h, so I should have written technically evaluated at s equals j omega equals h of j omega times u of j omega times e to the j omega t. So the output complex amplitude, which is the combination of these two, is just the the uh, uh, transfer function evaluated at j omega times the input amplitudes. That's what we've got here, right? We say that the output amplitude is just going to be the product of these two. So we could write this, we could rewrite this as h of j omega equals, so the output amplitude, let's give it a name. Let's call it y of j omega is equal to y, oops, I'll use blue, is equal to y um, of j omega divided by the input u of j omega. Okay, which is also equal to the um, transfer function h of s evaluated at s equals j omega, right? So this object, mathematical object, is called the frequency response function, okay? This is like, so we should go back. We should go back to our map. So if we go back to our map, uh, which is on the website, so let's go to the website, let's go to the course, let's go to um, resources. Um, oh, isn't it on the website? I thought it was on the website. Oh, I think it is for mechatronics. Oh, I th think I stuck it under. Is it in the notes for this class, or is it not? Is it under the? Is it under notes? No. Um, well, in any case, if I go to mechatronics. And I go to resources. There we go. So remember how we covered like all of this stuff up here in the in mechatronics and this. We got the system transfer function, which we did a couple weeks ago. And now we have the final piece of the puzzle, the frequency response function. We just defined it. Okay? It's just the system transfer function. We plug in s equals j omega. This could, this could be bigger, couldn't it? So this h of s, we can convert this to the frequency response function by plugging in the s equals j omega and vice versa if you want to go the other way. So we've got our final representation and this is these last two we haven't quite seen what they're used for yet but I'm telling you these two are really powerful so uh, so I guess to that was just to show you sort of the, the high-level view frequency response function um, 
easy to find if you have the transfer function. So just plug in s equals j omega, and you've got the frequency response function. Pretty straightforward. Now, what it, what it means, what the significance is, that's what we need to find out. So h of j omega is a complex function with a real part and an imaginary part. For a given input frequency omega, h of j omega is a complex number, right? You evaluate it, it's a complex number. It's a complex function, so if you evaluate it, it'll give you a complex number, which is easily represented in the complex plane. So if in the complex plane, if we were to draw some value of the imaginary and the real part of this function when it's evaluated, we would get you know, the real part and the imaginary part. We could also say, well, this is also just the, the magnitude of h of j omega and the phase of j omega, right? Because any complex number, we could represent it in this polar form, or we could represent it in the Cartesian real imaginary form. So the polar representation has a magnitude. Uh, do, you guys, do you guys know what the magnitude has to be in terms of the real and imaginary parts? So square root, that's good. Yeah, it's the sum of the squares. So if they're, I mean, it, it, it's kind of annoyingly long. But the real part of h of j omega squared, so that's this dimension, right? The real part squared, plus the imaginary part squared, just using Pythagorean theorem plus the imaginary part of h of j omega squared. So that's the magnitude. And then we just need the phase, which we could use a little trigonometry to find. You guys think of what that would be? Yeah, so it's arctangent of the imaginary part over the real part, right? Imaginary part of h of j omega, which is the vertical axis, divided by the real part of h of j omega. So I write a tan. You could write tan to the minus 1. It's the arctangent that you know and love. So, recall that we have been considering a complex sinusoidal input. Okay, so we started off, we said we want to do a real sinusoid, a sine omega t plus psi. However, let's use this complex one because the math is easier. So, we are doing that. If we want to um, know the steady state response to a real sinusoidal input, we can write this as a superposition of complex sinusoids. So a sine omega t, if we wanted to know the response to a sine omega t, we would just have to write that. This is Euler's formula that can convert the complex exponential form to the sinusoidal form. And this is just a complex sinusoid plus a complex sinusoid, scaled and added together. And this is also the cosine one. So using the principle of superposition, we can just combine, so we found what um, the particular solution is for a complex sinusoid up here, right? This guy, I uh, know, that's the frequency response function. This guy right here is a particular solution for the complex one. But we want to know what, what happens if we put in the real sinusoid, what's the output? And I'm not going to do the superposition, but as you can see, you could essentially plug in the solution here, scale it, and subtract another one, and 
a lot of stuff cancels out conveniently. Um, and you end up with this, that y particular solution of t, or I guess I prefer to say the steady state solution, steady state solution is equal to the input amplitude a, remember the input amplitude is a and the input and the input phase is psi, right? So the input amplitude multiplied by the magnitude of the frequency response function times sine of omega t plus the original phase, psi, plus the phase of the frequency response function. Aha! So, that means, once again, this is a result that we got actually long ago when we discovered that if you put in a sign in steady state, you get out a sign, right? And then the only things that change are the amplitude and the phase. And how they change, we never really explored how those two things change. We just said they, they change. And for specific problems, we could solve for how they changed. But we didn't have this relationship between the transfer function, the frequency response function, and how it changes. And the reason that the frequency response function is so important is that its magnitude is how much the amplitude changes, and its phase is how much the phase changes for a sinusoid at a given frequency. So if you put an input in at 27 hertz, if you plug that into the frequency response function, it gives you out a complex number, right? That complex number has a magnitude, which is whatever, you stick it right here, uh, and it has a phase, and you stick that right here. And that's how the sinusoid at that frequency would change, coming in and going out. And I would say we are often more concerned about the amplitude than the phase, but they're both important to us. The amplitude, I mean, you can imagine how we care about systems that uh, respond to certain frequencies and not others. We really need to know about that. We need to know, okay, uh, you can run this motor at, you know, 7,000 RPM, that's fine. Uh, but when you, st when you start up, you go through a resonance because we see a peak in the motion of the chassis when you go through you know 500 rpm so when you're speeding up you can't hang out long at 500 rpm or you're going to shake the whole thing apart their aircraft have similar things too you can't hang out at certain frequencies you can go through them as long as you move quickly if you stay at those frequencies it'll start to shake the whole thing apart so you you got to be got to be careful with those so this, that type of relationship is described by this frequency response function. So it's a very important result. And if you see this figure in Raoul and Wormley, you will see kind of a description of that. So, oops, uh, I'm not at that spot. I thought I was. There we go. 14.3. So this is just a depiction of an input sinusoid. Okay u and an output sinusoid y that has a phase shift and an amplitude change and that's just sort of to drive it home visually you put in a sinusoid you get out a sinusoid just the magnitude and phases change and the amplitude ratio between these two is the magnitude of the frequency response function which is pretty cool all right so that is the introduction. And then, let's see, I want to do...